Welcome everyone. <laughs> Thank you for coming to spend the day. And this is kind of a new format for us. So Francis is going to give a little context for the format so you'll be yeah. familiar with it. Okay. Hi everyone. Do we have um, room for yeah. everybody? Okay, great. Okay. There's a seat right here, by the way. It's still open. Looks like there's two. Yeah. Oh, you're this Okay, there's one free seat at the front right here. Another one over here. <coughs> there's a seat up here. Okay, well, my name is Frances Zhu. Um, so I'm here. I feel so honored to, to come to San Diego. It's my first time to San Diego and uh, to be able to meet with all of you and to present this documentary um, for this event. So just I just want to give you our overall context and then we're going to launch into a pretty deep journey for today and tomorrow, I believe. So this, um, this is a documentary called Take Me Home. It's an hour, 20 minutes long. And it took us a, two, a little over two years to make it. And we just finished it a few months ago. Um, this is a documentary, meaning that it, it really um, documented what happened in our lives. And, and we're a group of people uh, who felt called to devote our lives to the teachings of A Course in Miracles. And um, that's it. Everything that we do, everything we think, everything we practice is about the teachings of A Course in Miracles. And um, this documentary was shot in in a monastery, uh, Living Miracles Monastery, that is a monastery that is based on Course in Miracles. So people come to the monastery, they can come for a visit, and there are a lot of us who live there full-time, as full-time residents. Um, and about two years ago, we had a 30-day event called Tabula Rasa Mystery School. A tabula Rasa is a Latin word for blank slate. So that is the name of the mystery school. Um, and what is a mystery school? Mystery school was <coughs> just an event for us to come together and to hand our life over to be guided by the spirit and use each other to look at the deeper blocks that is blocking the mind to the loves of, to loves awareness, so that was that was the background of that event. And then about twenty people came to the mystery, the first mystery school. Um, they flew from all around the world. They came, and literally we all walked into the unknown because we didn't really have a curriculum. We didn't really have a curriculum. Actually, in the manual for teachers. Of a cross in miracles, um, there is this <coughs> sentence said, "Follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit." That is the core of this curriculum. Mm -hmm. So, if the whole course in miracles with three hundred and sixty-five lessons and all these word, words, and metaphysics and concepts, and there is one sentence saying this is the core of this curriculum, and that is follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And that is the core of the mystery school because we came together for 30 days and we didn't know w what is to be healed and what is to come up and what is going to happen, who will show up. So everything is left in the hands of the Holy Spirit. And all that we know was we provide a very <coughs> safe place for each other. We allow the deeper things to come up because our shared purpose. And, um, and why do we make a documentary 
movie. So the movie was literally just to capture what happened during these thirty days with a little bit of context and narration. But what? Why do we make a documentary movie? It wasn't anybody's intention. It wasn't to to teach, to preach, to do anything. Um, I received the dream in 2011 after my first round of living in the doc uh, in the monastery. So I. At that time, I was living in Sydney, Australia. I had a, a Course in Miracles group. Um, I was reading the course, trying to practice it very conceptually, you know, trying to make the most out of it. And then David came to Australia with some of the people who already lived in the monastery, and they came to say that in our monastery we practice no private thoughts and no people pleasing. That that are the only two guidelines of this Course in Miracle based monastery. And I thought, oh that is so scary. <laughs> I feel incredibly drawn to that <coughs> that two guidelines because I know I wasn't living it. And then I felt terrified as well. And why no private thoughts. I mean, we we want to take these two days to really look deep into some of these core teachings of the course. You know, in in the in one of the chapters, Jesus actually said, "This journey is a journey for us to exchange darkness for light mm-hmm. and ignorance for understanding." So. And he also said, nothing you understand is fearful. It's only fearful, not because what it is, but because it's hiddenness. So in that way, this no private thought guideline is saying, don't hide your thoughts, because in those thoughts, you define who you are. And you're terrified by your own definition and your own belief of who you are. So don't hide those thoughts because they are not real. Let's let's keep them up. Let's offer them up. And in the understanding, in the seeing, they cease to to be to terrify you and to 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 scare you. And then people pleasing is. It's a practical application of no compromise. Because Jesus said salvation is no compromise of any kind. And but if someone tell me at the beginning to say this journey of Course in Miracles is a journey of no compromise and you should stop compromising, I will be like, I don't know how, I don't even know what I'm compromising. I live my life as I live. I cannot even be aware of where I compromise is is how it is. So so that is the practical application of some very deep some very, very deep teachings of the course but but the monastery basically summarized it down to these two practical guidelines. And uh, when we had this mystery school of 30 days, really everybody was invited to a space of safety, to a shared purpose, but also just to come to learn to be totally transparent. And we're gonna look at some of those thoughts that is buried down there. (coughs) Not even to try to dig it, but they come up without our, our own control. They just do because the desire to heal was so strong. So, so I was I I when I heard first about these two guidelines, I felt very called to know more, and I I participated one of the retreats 
seven day retreat day they held in Australia had a very very profound experience my heart just opened up and I thought what well, even this what we're meant to live heart wide open and feel connected with with love if this is what the course is teaching then I'm, I'm all in you know I'm all in so I came to the monastery after after that and uh, practice and live and did a lot of projects for the purpose of looking at the thoughts and after that I went back to, to Australia waiting for my next step and then this is where the dream came in to say if you felt this much hope and this much happiness and joy from being transparent and from this work you know you need to share it and you will make a documentary movie about it and that was very loud and clear that was 2011 and then I came straight back to the monastery and lived there <coughs> since then but the movie never came in all these years it was a long preparation many many projects many many expressions many many relationships with the people who live there to really look at the commitment to this awakening and looking at whatever that's that's uh, blocking the way so yeah two two and a half years ago all the signs and symbol came together that a team was sent there are two filmmakers even were sent to the to be part of the mystery school and to be part of the movie so and as the spirit was very present saying okay this is what we're gonna do you don't need to know the story you don't need to know what uh, the theme of the movie is I'm just guiding you day by day mm -hmm. so all you need to do is to pray and to do what I tell you to do and that's it so I never had the bigger picture of what's gonna come out until I, I finished it so this is uh, a very much a work of listen and follow the guidance uh, letting go of everything else for myself and for, for everybody that are involved we had about about 10 people who were on the team, two experienced filmmakers, but they also came with the purpose of healing. They didn't come here to make a movie, so we, we had a, a very singular purpose together to, to use this project for, ve for that very same reason. And um, so we finished the movie in May, and now the spirit is taking over completely ever since then. <coughs> He said, let's show it in the monastery um, August, and then let's show it in California. Holland is next, Brazil after. It was completely, we were okay. We were going wherever. So now we have Susanna here with me. Susanna and Jeffrey were part of the movie team, were part of the mystery school. You will see they're in the movie. And you will probably only want to talk to these two after you see the movie tomorrow, but they're here to answer all the questions. And then David as well, so it feels so <coughs> amazing to, to be able to show the movie with David because it is a documentary, it's very experiential, not a lot of words, um, more show instead of tell kind of experience. And yet the documentary is, is done through a very deep intention and is pointing to a very deep uh, teaching. So it just feel like to have David here, then we, we can really get into a deep experience before the movie, during the movie, and after for these couple of days. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's almost like if you, <coughs> if you were on your spiritual journey and you were pointed towards a, a fountain of wisdom and you could go and drink this this today and tomorrow you will have that opportunity to really drink from the fountain in a very profound way. Um, not only are the four of us here sitting up here who were part of the mystery school, but um, 
Carly it was also part of the mystery school and, and had a lot of deep experiences. And also Tina is here all the way from Sweden, uh, and she was part of a mystery school as well. A mystery school was just a 30-day residential, but if you can imagine spending 30 days with Mother Teresa in Calcutta, or 30 days with St. Francis, or uh, maybe more recently, more like 30 days with Father Keating, where you could uh, sit around and kind of ask questions of Father Keating, uh, or of, of saints and mystics, um, in the sense that that uh, the people in the community don't don't have jobs, they they don't they aren't engaged in the typical human survival things. Much like in a monastery, you know, the nuns and the priests are. It would be like going to spend thirty days with Thomas Merton at the Abbey of Gethsemane down in Bardstown, Kentucky, where you sit there with Thomas and you just. <coughs> You know, you're praying, there's a lots of silence, there's a lot of emotions coming up, like cloud storms moving through your mind quickly, because you aren't engaged in the minutia, the, the logistics. Uh, the Course, of course, uses all those logistics. The Course is a great pathway, because it's not a pathway that's saying you have to spend four, eight, ten, twelve hours of meditation a day. For most people in the, we call it the industrialized, world, uh, we call it civilized world, although when you go to the Aborigines and some of these, the Native Americans, you wonder who is civilized and who is not civilized. The peaceful ones seem to be living like, uh, like Newton message down under, taking walkabout, using telepathy in the outback of Australia, and then we have places like New York City and Paris and Los Angeles that <laughs> where we call the civilized world, but it's really about bigger, better, faster, more, gross national product, you know, what have you done for me lately, what's your sales quota, did you meet your sales quota this week? This monastery is coming into a presence of deep devotional practice of A Course in Miracles, with the focus on self-realization and enlightenment, on know thyself, that the Greeks talked about way back, even before Jesus, the Greeks were saying, know thyself. That's, they, they summarize their whole teachings. <laughs> know thyself. How beautiful. So, a lot of the, the teachers that are, I mean, I have traveled in 44 countries and, and been teaching the Course for the last three decades, and, and yet my focus was on mysticism. So I was not only in the Course and diving down the rabbit hole with the Course, but also with quantum physics, with also with Advaita Vedanta, also with the non-dual pathways of the world, meeting mystics, saints, being invited to ashrams, being on mountains and valleys, uh, doing gatherings like this, in, literally in the thousands of times over those three decades. Um, and I've had many privileges and honors to be with with, with Ken you mentioned, Ken Wapnick, and with Judy Scutch and, and her partner who's now deceased, uh, William Whitson, who was in charge of the translations of the Course into all these languages over, over decades. Mm -hmm. And so I've been very privileged to be in the presence of those who have dedicated their lives to the Course. One time I was having a meal with Judy and, and her daughter and a number of others, and she kind of leaned over to me, sometimes she, she's called me different things. She called me one time, she was sitting next to me, she, she looked and she said, he's like a prophet. <laughs> so I've kind of been called a prophet, I've been called many different names, mystic and so forth, but I'm kind of have taken it down to the depths of what this is about. The lady that just introduced me at Huntington Beach, she said, well, here's a man who has no ego. And she went on to explain that that is, that David doesn't come from fear or guilt anymore, it just comes from heart-opening love. At one point Judy was saying that her and Ken Wapnick, uh, who's been a prominent uh, teacher of A Course in Miracles, they were having a discussion and, and she and Ken were talking and, and Ken was saying to her, um, you know, we're plan B. And Judy, Scotch Whitson was like, plan B? I don't even know if I like the sound of Plan B. What is, what is Plan B? <laughs> and we're part of 
receiving the course with Helen, and we're part of publishing the course, we're part of translating the course, we're part of distributing the course, it's like, yeah, okay, why is that plan B? Well, plan B is that, and plan A is living it. <laughs> plan A is living it every second of every day, living it without compromise, going beyond the words even, going into the deep stillness, going into the mystical experiences, going into direct union with God. That's plan A. Of course that would have to be plan A of every spirituality. It's not so much the theology in the end. That the Course even says that you have to forget the theology of the Course at some point. Forget this world in Lesson 189. Forget the, this world, forget this Course and come with holy, empty hands unto your God. When I first read that passage, I just my heart chords were going, and Jesus was in my mind just saying, pay attention, I'm giving you a, a nice little paragraph here, if you want to drop off with me into a communion experience with this paragraph from Lesson 189, you're certainly welcome to do so. And it was the same feeling I had when I read the I Need Do Nothing section, which is packed right in the middle of the text, when I started him saying, if you want to really show true allegiance, here's, here's my one instruction, I need do nothing. <laughs> and that is like an invitation into a state of mind beyond the words, just a, a state of mind of communing, of realizing yourself. So, this part of living the Course, as I began with the Course out in La Jolla, I was just in, we, we ended up going to see kind of a quantum movie yesterday in La Jolla at the AMC Theater, and I was telling him, La Jolla, this is where the Course dropped into my hands in 1986, Carl Rogers and the Association of Humanistic Psychology, and the Course dropped into my hands in this very town, and we're watching this quantum movie, which is kind of showing the simultaneity of time and, and communication that transcends linear time, and so I was like, wow, we're back. We're back here. It's like, like what is it, 30, 33 years later and I'm here in La Jolla and, and here it's all flashing, like here it is. And, and during those 33 years it's just been so beautiful because we, I had to go into an experience and then as soon as I went into this connection with Jesus and like Helen could hear Jesus giving me conversational instructions where to go, who to meet, who to call. It made my life very simple. Uh, like Francis just did the whole, an entire movie just through listen and follow with no experience whatsoever as a filmmaker. She googled director uh, at the beginning. <laughs> She's like, whoa! <laughs> I googled YouTube, what does a director do? And the summary is everything. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, Neo in the Matrix, whoa. <laughs> like, okay, here it comes, but I have no clue what's going to do. Because it, it involves a lot of things. And for me it was the same thing. I was very shy, I was voted most quiet in my senior class, I was the wallflower that blends in and never speaks, I was very timid, and uh, I didn't have a relationship until I was 27 years old. I was that shy. And then the Course came at that 27 year old point. It was almost like, okay Jesus, you made, you, David you made it through there. You haven't really experienced these uh, relationships as I'm going to use them, but <laughs> it's better that you experience them as I would use them rather than the way the ego uses them to keep you stuck in time and space. My use will be to lift you out. And so, from 27 on to 61, this has been a, a very expansive uh, adventure. I call it adventure because it's, uh, it's been a major adventure in the mind. But it also has taken me beyond the search for meaning within the form. I think a lot of times, human beings, the human condition, we search for meaning in, in individuality, in achievements, accomplishments, education, skills, development. We search for meaning in interpersonal relationships, we search for it in groups, we search for it in loyalties to country, to 
all kinds of hobbies and interests. You know, we try to have a composite identity based on past learning. And basically the Course is saying that no amount of past learning will free your mind to the Kingdom of Heaven. That basically all of time and space has been learned. You've learned the cosmos, you've overlearned it without even pausing to question, why am I doing all this complicated learning? Why am I keep building my self-concept, building an image, when the Course is saying you were created perfect at, from the beginning, at, at, in your eternal creation, you're innocent, you're perfect, and you don't need any self-help. You need forgiveness of the self-image that you made. You need have to learn how to let go or undo what you've been learning. So, after about 10 years full-time of university, undergrad and grad, that's when the Course came into my life. and. Jesus immediately told me to drop academia, like, no, reverse. You have overlearned. You, you now think you have skills and abilities and you've got all this pride. You've got a chip of academia on your shoulder the size of a boulder. And he's like, we need to get rid, we need to literally let go of the whole boulder. You're not going to become humble. You're not going to become a miracle worker. You're not going to become a healing agent of the Spirit of God with pride. No one with pride can experience, can express, can extend the presence of God's love. Why? Because the whole cosmos of time and space was made as a defense against God's love. Many of you are familiar with the Judeo-Christian you know, view of the world. Some of you remember the Bible, Genesis, God created the heavens, and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested, and so on and so forth. What's true, God did create the heavens, not the celestial, you know, the realms of time and space, but the kingdom of heaven is pure spirit, and that is a creation of God. And the earth is a projection, along with all the black holes, all the cosmos, everything of time and space, and linear time is a projection of the ego. If, if you imagine back in your high school days, you know, a football game, is it a home game where you have all the crowd cheering or is it a road game where you're on the road? When you come to time and space, you're on the road. You're in hostile territory. You are in the, the, devil's, uh, the devil's kingdom, we'll say. It's a projection, time and space are a projection of the ego. So you're on a road game. It's, it's going to be it can seem a bit uphill playing on the road. There's not like you can hear the crowd cheering. You usually just hear the expectations spoken of all the people around you. Well, oh, you could have done this different. I can give you some good advice. Oh, you should have done that. Could have, would have, should have. You know, oh, your history, that's terrible. That's awful. You should be guilty. If I did that, I'd be guilty too. You know, we're on a road game where the reflections are very, very dark in time and space because this is not natural. We are, we are experiencing an unnatural state of mind. You don't even have to worry about like the old days of heaven and hell, you know, you'll burn in eternal hell, you know, the, the kind of the Baptist or the old heaven and hell. No, this perceptual cosmos is hell. And, and what you're wanting to do when you forgive it is to escape from the fatigue, the pain, the suffering, the heaviness, the grief, the sadness, the shame, the dark, dark forces and the dark, dark emotions that are unnatural, that are completely unlike the Kingdom of Heaven. The Kingdom of Heaven is vibrant, it's joyful, it's blissful, it's happy, it's expansive, there's no limits to it. It's your home. The name of the movie is Take Me Home. And sometimes people have started watching the movie and they start crying. On the first scene, they start crying. Because I think it's that feeling of, I want, like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, <laughs> I want to go home. I want to know my home. I don't want to try to keep existing and surviving as a body <coughs> in time and space. I want to find the kingdom of heaven within. So, it's very deep. Uh, a lot of the movies that, that I share around the world now, are, I call them like quantum movies. We saw another one at La Jolla yesterday, but I love 
movies that I can use with commentary from Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and so people have sprung into mystical experiences in the movie gatherings. Uh, sometimes I've worked with the Course for five, ten, one time a woman in Venezuela, 14 years with the Course, and she'd never had a mystical experience until I was showing Jim Carrey in Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind with Kate Winslet, and somewhere in the middle of it, pshh, the tears came and she went into a direct experience and at the end of the movie she came running up to me and she hugged me in Caracas I was and she said God is real there's really a God I was hanging <laughs> with the course I was doing the lessons I was reading the reading the text I was really hanging in there but she just was oh my God my life is never going to be the same because of a direct experience kind of giving her a burst, a little taste, a little glimpse of what is there for all of us, even though it's heavily covered over by ego defenses. Even with the Course, if you think Jesus was here in linear time a couple thousand years ago, and it took a couple thousand years for Jesus to get a, a scripture as clear as the Course in Miracles, into this realm through Helen Schuckman and with Bill Thedford collaborating. And now we all have the blessing of a very clear scripture. But we also know that the ego fog is very thick. So the temptations and the lures of idols, the lures of building careers, the lures of, of fo being focused on the family, the, the, all the things of this world that take our attention, that draw us, these are all what Jesus would say temptations. What is temptation but the wish to make illusions real? This wish to make a false identity and to find happiness and joy in the false identity is, is only strong because of your mind's investment in it. In other words, you made the ego by believing in it, and you can dispel it by withdrawing your belief from it. So the Course is really about withdrawing your investment in the ego belief in your mind. It's not about fixing the world, it's not about changing the world, it's not about making the world a better place, it's not about self-improvement because your capital self, your Christ self, is perfect and needs no improvement, but it is about removing the obstacles to the awareness of love's presence. It is about making the conditions in your mind so conducive and letting that heart fire, that desire grow so strong in yourself that you open up to even brief direct experiences of God's love, which in The Course in Miracles you could say the, the most direct experience you can have of God's love is called revelation. But this is non-perceptual. When I had three revelatory experiences, it's like, it was literally the disappearance of the universe. It was literally all perception, the veil parted. The three-dimensionality collapsed, and then the veil parted, and it was the great rays. It was just direct experience, and, and those direct experiences were very important for me, because it was like, after I seemed to come back from them, everything looked a little more surreal, and it felt more like a movie. And the characters didn't seem like really solid characters, they seemed like characters in a movie, you know, it was very surreal. And also, I became very sure of my function, which was to go deeper and deeper into this experience and then take the teachings of A Course in Miracles and bring them to people in ways like movies, like music. So around me for decades now, I've had I've traveled the world with singer-songwriters, with some of them with the most amazing abilities, amazing voices, amazing instrumentals. We've had whole music festivals, actually music uh, and enlightenment uh, festivals, and now we've got music, movies and enlightenment festivals where we come together and we watch these quantum movies, we have these amazing music experiences of collaborators that come and share the deep presence through song and music and and also with uh, 
with the movies. We've actually had uh, movie festivals. And now this movie today you'll see is, is like an outpicturing of this deep experience of letting all this darkness come up. It's not really comfortable once you turn yourself over to God and say, okay, use me now, clear away all the unconscious darkness. If any of you have read the, the saints and the mystics, the Saint Teresa of Avila, the, the Saint John of the Cross who coined the phrase, dark night of the soul, you will see in the characters' faces the dark night <laughs> of the soul. Because they have come for 30 days with one purpose, is to not hide and protect the darkness anymore, to let it up. And that's the beauty of this as well. It doesn't look pretty, uh, but, but in the context of so much love, and so much safety, and so much of a deep feeling of, of security, you can let the darkness up. It's very, very intense. It's almost like, uh, you had to look at a, a metaphor in the world, it's like, it's like going to the dentist for a root canal, <laughs> waving off all the Novocaine and anesthesia. Imagine yourself going and you're laying That's down, terrible. you're kind of looking around, and you're going, <laughs> where's the, you know, because for me, for me in my life, you know, I, I was the dentist's office many times, and I was always like, whatever, what do you got? <laughs> Laughing gas? <laughs> anesthesia? Whatever. Bring it on, bring it on. And then they'd come in with this big, long needle that's like this long. Send it into my jaw. Come on, send it in there. Yeah. But, but emotionally, I'm saying emotionally, that when you say, okay, I would hide nothing now from the light. I would let every, kind of like that old game, all alien come free, all you dark secrets and dark chambers, we're going to open to the light now. We're not going to hide anymore. We've been playing this hide and seek game for a millennial and playing it out and seemingly incarnating to all these different forms to avoid facing this and healing for once and for all and waking up from this entire dream of, of, of linear time. So, what's so beautiful is these sessions today and also uh, you'll feel the experiential, you'll feel the interactiveness of the movie because that's how we, we work with movies. You, you will engage with the characters and you will, you may experience some of the feelings and the emotions. Even when I was just showing the movie uh, to Judy Scutch uh, last week, uh, she was in her wheelchair because she broke her leg, but she was sitting next to me and there was a few scenes where I was right next to her so I heard a gasp. <laughs> and then afterwards, I saw myself in all of those characters. I, I could see they were just acting out different things that I had gone through in my life, almost like a flash of here they are again, revisited. And ultimately there is only one of us. That, that what I keep sharing with everybody is, is if you give yourself so fully over to your function, your purpose in this life, you will be pleasantly surprised that everything you believe you still need, everything you believe would be helpful for you, everything, every kind of person you would want to meet, every kind of book you would want to read, every kind of music you would want to listen to, and every kind of movie you would want to see, will all come into your awareness effortlessly when you say, here I am, take me, use me. So, for me, when I was at 27, experiencing the intensity of that first romantic relationship, <laughs> Jesus is like, good, good, good. Now, this is what I call the special love relationship. <laughs> and I've got nine chapters in my book, from 15 to 24, to help you navigate this. It's going to be kind of sticky, it's going to be murky. You're going to feel like you're in quicksand. You're going to think, what did I get myself? What am I, how did my feet? <laughs> you're going to feel up to your chin, like you can barely breathe, because of the guilt and pain and shame that's going to come up in this context. But I've got nine chapters here. I'm going to lay it out for you. 
and you will be guided through this and you will emerge as yourself, as your Christ self in the end. So don't get too worried, even though that Jesus says that there was all is one in heaven, then there seemed to be this tiny mad idea called ego. Into eternity where all is one, there crept a tiny mad idea in which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. And then immediately when the ego seemed to be believed in as a possibility, the Holy Spirit was given as an immediate answer and it took the Holy Spirit less than one second. The Holy Spirit simultaneously answered the separation. It wasn't a, a battle, it wasn't a fight. When you turn a light on in a room, darkness doesn't battle the light to see who's going to go out. When that light's on, it's over. So it was handled, the, the fall from grace, the separation from God, the belief that it's possible was handled in one instant. And the Holy Spirit immediately made a defense against the correction, because <laughs> that instant was the Holy Spirit was the correction. And that defense against the correction was the special love relationship. Was trying to make love in form that would take the place of the correction. That's why it's so insidious. That's why the two relationships discussed in those chapters from 15 to 24 are special hate relationships, which are pretty easy to recognize. We know the ones where we can't stand somebody and we know we have to forgive. Those are pretty obvious. But it's the special love relationships that we don't see was made by the ego as a substitute for love. Like the Madonna, Ray of Light album, Substitute for Love. Those were made to, to be so attractive that the mind wouldn't see that being attracted to them was the, actually the attraction to guilt, the attraction to staying asleep, the distraction to perpetuate the ego was all made into a glimmery, shiny thing. So he even has, he says, uh, he uses pictures as an example, but he says the, the drops of blood shine like rubies and the tears sparkle like diamonds. Easy, when Jesus puts blood, <laughs> which is something we're, we're used to hearing about as something that's kind of a, we don't like to talk about blood or hear it, about it very much. In fact, when it comes out of the body, it's not a good thing. <laughs> you know, oh, I'm leaving! Ha <laughs> ha! You know, oh, you know the blood that shines like rubies and tears that sparkle like diamonds. How clever, how devious the ego is to make up something that would be different from our own reality, our eternal reality, that would lure us to stay asleep, that would lure us into shame, that would lure us into guilt. I remember I spent a lot of hours with Ken Wapnick, the, the book that uh, you were just showing to everybody, and I spent many, many times with him him and his wife up in, in the Catskill Mountains back in the 1990 and the early 1990s, and I had a friend up there who came from England, and she worked in the kitchen, and she would say, Every time they did a workshop or a seminar, Ken and Gloria, and every time they did it on those topics from chapter 15 to 24, mm -hmm. they had to buy five times as much food. Mm -hmm. And I said, really? And she said, people would come and stuff <laughs> their faces. The resistance mm -hmm. to those teachings in the middle of the text is so enormous that people would literally overeat at those workshops. And I would be like, fascinating, a hundred people there and they're all stuffing their faces. She said, happens every time. If we, if we do those sections, people have enormous resistance. And, and I thought, that reminded me of an early course group I was in, uh, where I went there and I, I would let the Holy Spirit, Jesus speak through me every week, every Tuesday night. I would show up with this group of 20 to 35 people and then I would do this week after week where I would just let Jesus speak through me, almost like a, a channel. And then the funniest thing would be, the group had no facilitator. It was a course group without a facilitator. And so I would show up, they would all start reading a paragraph at a time, reading the course, and then whenever anybody had a question, 
they would ask the question and all the heads would turn to the David figure like, and Jesus says what? <laughs> you know, it would be like, question and all the heads turn. And then question and all the heads turn. So it was kind of a strange course group by most people's standards. You know. But because I was channeling Jesus, I was, I was able to kind of give examples because the questions would be, like, I don't get this. You know, a lot of the teachings are so deep that they kind of fly over the level of readiness. And then I would give examples, and this is what he's saying, and, and I would refer to other parts of the text. Uh, there was one point where I, I was reading the Course for about eight hours a day. I was using it as an oracle. I would pray, and I would ask a question, and then open the book seemingly randomly. We know there's nothing really random, and then the answer would come. So I did this for a few years, and then there was actually one point where I think I read the course, because I was reading it for eight hours a day, that I would go to course groups, and a friend of mine named Mary was at the course group, and there was a priest there, and they said, oh, I think Jesus says something about this somewhere in the book, and I started verbatim just rattling off paragraphs from the book. I had a, a, a photographic kind of memory, so I had memorized word for word, and went through the first paragraph, and they were like, <gasps> and I went through the second, <gasps> and then, then my friend Mary, she said, no, it's not, and then they went in, ah! They couldn't believe that I, I was verbatim, because a lot of people have resistance, they, they say, I don't exactly know what it says, but it says something like, and I was like speaking it all verbatim, because I had actually memorized paragraphs, sections, I'd immersed in audio books, and everything for so many hours, you know, if you love something and you have a devotion to something, then that's just like a natural outgrowth. And then I started showing up at course conferences and people would say, David is a walking course encyclopedia. And that's when Jesus said, yeah, we need to do a lot more inner work because do you want to be known as an encyclopedia or would you rather spend eternity with me? <laughs> you. <laughs> So that's when I was sent for five years on drive about, like they do walk about in Australia, drive about the United States. I was out here in California quite a bit because I've never seen so many course groups <laughs> in the world as you have in California. And I was hippity hopping around and teaching what I would learn, teaching what I would learn over and over and over in hundreds and hundreds of course groups, learning how to step back and let him lead the way, where to go, even one time, the first road trip he had me on, uh, I was coming down through uh, Oklahoma, and I was going to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I had one of these uh, Miracle Distribution Center lists back, back then of course groups. And then I'm in the car, and he says, turn here, go here. This was before the days of GPS, uh, the early, before iPhones and smartphones, and turn here, go here go there, and it's like, it's a church, and it's, I'm like, it's Sunday morning, and it's a church, and it's like five minutes, five or ten minutes towards noon. And I look at the thing, and I, I say, okay, okay, Jesus, all right, thank you. I see there's a course meeting at this church, thank you very much. But the meeting is from 11 to 12. I am not walking in on the last five minutes of A Course in Miracles. And he says, oh, yes, you are. <laughs> Why do you think I brought you to this church? I said, but there's only, he said, get out of the car. So I go in, <laughs> I go in, I sit down, it's a lively Course in Miracles, and they're having a big sex discussion <laughs> in the Course in Miracles group. I mean, it's lively. And, oh, no, he says this. I don't know about that. Well, what about me? I don't, I, but I feel this. What can I do? I can't deny my emotion. So they're having this, I just walked in at the tail end of, of a 30, of an hour meeting, the last five minutes, and then I just kind of am sitting in the back, because they're having this lively sex discussion at the course group, and then after that, then here they come, come up to me, there was a guy named Jack Barnes, and he's like, well howdy, well, we didn't even see you, we're a little embarrassed at what we were talking about there, we don't always talk like this in our meetings, but you know, this is Oklahoma, and I'm, you know, I'm on the road in my little three-cylinder car, just really navigating with Jesus, and, well, come on, 
I'm going to take a group of us, we're going out to eat the lunch, and it's Sunday morning, so you come on out with us. I'll buy you lunch and everything. Out I go with Jack and the whole thing. We had a lively discussion. What are you doing? Where'd you come from? You don't sound like you're from around here. You know, the, so I'm out there having a wonderful meeting with all of them, and then after about an hour, an hour and a half goes, it's like Sunday afternoon, Jack's like, well, come on, you come back to my condominium and, you know, my house is your house and I'm so happy you're here and everything. We go over to the condominium and he said, do you, do you like to swim? I got, there's a hot tub and a swimming pool and, you know, and you want to watch my TV? I got, a, I got some things I got to do this afternoon, but you stay in my house, you eat my food, you do whatever you want. And this was like my third day of out on the road with Jesus. I'm like, holy Jesus, I don't have this kind of reception in my family. Uh, if this is the kind of reception, you know, we, I said, these are strangers. And Jesus is like, no, I'm, I'm going to teach you no one's a stranger. I'm taking care of you. I'm going to send the witnesses to you. I'm going to convince your mind that you're happy and whole and that you're the Christ. And you need to just listen and follow me, like with the movie. Just listen and follow that simple. We're going into the practical application of A Course in Miracles. We're not going in to try to be the scribes and the Pharisees and dissect every single passage and, and figure it out. We're going into an experience that you are loved, you are taken care of, you are provided for, you need to take thought for nothing of this world because everything will be given you if you will simply be a witness for my love. I will take care of all time and space. I will arrange time and space for you if you will be a miracle worker. Mind-blowing. How many, Nobody tells us that... No, how, did you have any parents that said they would arrange time and space for you if you, <laughs> if you give yourself to love? I, my parents were. I mean, I was raised in the church and Protestant faith and everything, but we would talk about the weather and the sports, but we, we know we really never talked much about Jesus that much. And then now with this, it was like everyone I would meet at these course groups, they want to talk about Jesus, they want to talk about divine love, they want to talk about forgiveness. So this guy Jack, he leaves. I'm now I'm sitting there and I'm in this beautiful condominium. I'm thinking, wow, this is wild. This is like my third night out. And now I'm, I'm in this amazing place. And then he comes back a few hours later. Did you have a good rest? Did you take a swim? Did you have anything to eat? And I said, no, I'm still adapting here. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of love uh, and generosity for somebody that I've never met. Oh, come on. He said, I've got a houseboat. And <laughs> I'm going to let, let's call, call our Course in Miracles group together. And let's go out in the, for a dusk drive out on the lake, oh, and I, you seem to know a lot about this Course in Miracles. I think my whole group would like to hear about that. And we have to continue this sex discussion because I want to understand what Jesus says about this. And so he gets on the phone, can you make it tonight? Can you make calls up? Potluck on the houseboat, on <laughs> sunsetting, out at some lake, and I'm out there. And we're sitting having these deep Course in Miracles discussions on the roof of this houseboat, the sun's going down, it's all the water sparkly, it's just totally surreal. We finally, we pull in at night, when the sun goes down, we pull in Sunday night, and then he says to me, well, we all got to go to work, tomorrow's Monday morning, but you're welcome to stay on this houseboat for as long as you want. And I'm just like, on top of everything, like, oh my God. <laughs> and. And Jesus was like assuring me, like, listen, I'm going to, you hang with me, I'll knock your socks off. I, you think you know how this world operates? Well, you don't know how it operates in miracles. You just know from your past learning. Survival, struggle, education, survive every day. Do the best that you can to make it through another day of survival. He said, I'm going to blow that out of the water, and I'm going to show you that there's another inspired way to live if you listen and follow. And at the beginning, I was so quiet and shy that, you know, I wasn't used to doing lots of public speaking because I, I was so, so shy. And I was just starting to come out of that with course groups in, in Cincinnati, Ohio, before I left. And basically, Jesus said, 
at, after a while, about a, a year or year, year and a half, he said, now I'm going to, we're going to do one more step here. He said, I, I want you to not only listen to me, but I want to speak through you. I want to start to use the body of David as, a, as a, an instrument. So your speaking engagements, you're going to, I'll take you to more cruise, course groups and you're going to actually, it'll undo your fear around speaking and it will wash away your shyness if you let me use the body in that way repeatedly. So it was teach what you would learn, just just show up and be willing. And and I had some experience with it at that course group in Cincinnati where I would just speak when there was an opening. But he would he said, Oh there's a lot more. I want to do I want to share a lot more. So what we're going to do today through our questions and answers this morning and through our preparations and then this afternoon, um, Francis actually would like, after lunch when you all come back, she would like to do some experiential exercises with you, where it's their heart opening exercises that just make your mind more ready for the movie. Because this movie is not like a traditional kind of movie that's just out there for, to go around the world as a source of entertainment or amusement. It's like a tool that if your heart is open, you're able to receive more from the experiences in the movie. The receptivity. So this open discussion we'll have this morning with questions, answers, you can ask anything you want of, of us, of, of any of us. Uh, also during the break, uh, since, since Carly's here and, and Tina's here, you know, it may be like, well, what was your experience in this 30 days of giving yourself over in the high desert? I mean, this is like, <laughs> this is way out there. This is not close to, it's so still that you don't hear planes, the planes don't go overhead, the chipmunks come up to you, the animals do eye gazing with you. It's like a St. Francis sanctuary out where this mystery school takes place. So there's a strong communion experience, even with all the animals. Mm -hmm. they, they're they very friendly and they they really are very playful because they don't have, they're reflecting the love, like around St. Francis. They felt the gentleness and so they, they felt, oh, well, we can be ourselves. This guy's, this guy's harmless. He's, he's a happy one. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the vibe that you can experience with that. So, I would like, while we have this time this morning, I would love for, as we always do, just to open it up to you for any questions you have. We actually practice complete transparency. So there aren't any embarrassing questions for me. There aren't any questions where you can go, well, I, I would love to ask this, but I won't because that's too embarrassing. Actually, the transparency is what no private thoughts and no people pleasing is about. That's why we we have those guidelines in our community for this transparency to flourish. For us to realize we have nothing really to hide. That, that those secrets we were concerned about were just beliefs that we, we were trying to hold on to. We believed we had to hide them. But actually we start to realize when we don't hide them we clear our channel open so that the love can pour through. And when we hold on to secrets and private thoughts, then we basically just block our channels. And we're too afraid to, to be fully vibrant, to be fully free with our sharing of our love and our ideas when, when we go into that. So, yeah, I think it's beautiful we can, we can open it up. And, and all of us here are, are in, in the movie, so as you watch the movie, I think too, you, you, you'll you be able to ask any questions about when that scene, what were you going through? What was, what was in your mind? Because we're, we're all waking up together, you know, we, we're all deep friends that have been brought together by the Holy Spirit for this awakening. So we're among friends, we're in a place of love and safety. <laughs> Zen's made a beautiful haven here for us, to, to, like a crucible for us to go through a healing experience together. 
I find the subject secrets quite intriguing because I feel like I have been so secretive and um, I know it comes from a place of feeling I'll, I'll be judged. So I feel like I've lived a lot of secrets. So it's interesting that <coughs> you don't keep any secrets <laughs> and then you just say what you feel in the moment. So like if you're feeling something about someone and you're in your group, so then you just say what you actually feel or do think about them? Well, that's why um, it's a great question because that's why I want to do a little experiential sec exercise this afternoon and then we go into the movie and this exercise will show you how to share and how to actually open up and practice um, sharing those thoughts. The secret, it's, it's an interesting thing. Jesus actually says in the Course, um, nothing has hidden value. There is no hidden value because you know in this world we, we sometimes use it, that word hidden value. So the value is unrecognized. And he played with the word. He said there's no hidden value because nothing hidden can be shared. So in for, for Jesus, value is in sharing. Value is in, in recognizing that you, know, you can find yourself through your brother and without sharing who we are, we can never find out. Because the whole mistake and the ego's defense, like David said, there's so much defense against this awakening and against God's love that we don't even know we live in defense all the time. And one of the biggest defense is isolation because the ego doesn't want us to realize the brother and myself are the same. It's the last thing. So he wants us to see everybody's different, everybody has their own personality type, Everybody has a different name, different career, differences, and they have their issue, you have your issue. Sometimes you agree, but the last thing the ego wants to know, or want us to find out, is they're you. And the, the reason the spirit, this course in miracles is a journey with relationships, is just because of that. Because healing is recognizing your brother is you. So there is no more direct way to go straight toward that goal by going toward your brother and by sharing. What What is there to share? Physical possessions to share? No, ideas is who we are. So we're here to share what we are. And what we don't even know what we are because it's so buried you know, self-deception is, is such a habit. I remember at the beginning of the journey, um, when I was living in Australia, there was a, a popular thing that people were experimenting, uh, being total, totally honest for 24 hours. You know, you, <laughs> it's like a challenge. Can you be completely honest for 24 hours? And it was so difficult, that, which means no white lies, no deliberate omission of certain truth, definitely not deliberate lying. And then now I'm looking back and thought, yeah, because we live in self-deception and it, it's, it's doing it consciously or unconsciously, but that becomes the way this world is constructed, our lives are constructed. So the way we teach ourselves is through self-deception through the ego. And the spirit is just completely undoing it. And I was sometimes looking at David's example, you know, he really started to turn everything upside down and inside out to say, okay, if this journey is about sharing, let's just share because who we are is, is buried underneath from our own awareness. And if we share our own ideas, inevitably at the beginning, there seem to be dark ideas. We, we is judging, is attacking, attack thoughts. And that's why the ego said, don't, don't share everything because you don't want people to know how dark you are. 
but that's not. That's just the, the most surface layer. You know, when we allow those things to come up, what's inevitably coming up is actually this light and innocence. So the way I see David's life and what attracts all of us to be around is okay. Let's let's live a life of sharing, and let's live a life that we want to teach ourselves where it leads to, and mm-hmm. uh, because it's so far from our awareness. You know, the end goal is seems to be in a distance, but through sharing, we receive an experience straight away. Yeah, I think the the first phase that you go through when you just begin to say, okay, I'm going to turn towards you, light. I'm going to turn towards you, spirit. It seems to be exposing, but if the secrets have been there, and the speak- secrets are designed not to expose, to hide, to keep things. People do this with their identity, around their sexuality, around all kinds of things. Um, I remember growing up in my family, and, and they said, there's two things you should never talk about, David. And I said, I was young, I was like, what? What are those two things? Don't talk about God in public, and don't talk about religion in public. Because, you know, it's going to be a a storm. (laughs) If you like storms, then just talk about God and religion in public. I had heard a joke, somebody recently said, "If if you go to a, you're living in a forest by yourself and you get extremely lonely, uh, just begin talking about politics and <laughs> someone will show up <laughs> in the forest. Where did you come from? Uh, to be combative with your political beliefs. <laughs> you could be way out in the middle of the Amazon rainforest just talking about politics. There they are. But it's, it's similar that if you start to just say, I'm not going to try to keep everything repressed and suppressed in my unconscious mind, then that first thing about, we'll call it disclosure, is exposing. Think of it as like two friends. Who you're really your friends, your besties, you love each other and everything, and one starts to have a, a bit of anxiety and tension, and the other one is going, is something going on? What's going on? Spill the beans. Come on, it's me. I love you. You can spill the beans with me. I'm lo- I'll love you no matter what. Spill the beans. Spill it's the beans. A it's a trap. <laughs> right, and there you go, right. <laughs> Suzanne's like, there you go, and I go, oh, you're my best friend, all right, but I'm still, I, because of the conditioning we have, that's why we keep the secrets, is because we don't want to be attacked, we don't want to be betrayed, we don't want to be abandoned. You know, why would you want to open up with your life partner if it could cost you your relationship, you see? That's the fear. So we have so much ego reinforcement and conditioning that's saying, don't spill the beans. Don't say it. Don't say it. Just smile. Just smile. You know, it, the ego wants us to wear the mask and keep the mask up. It doesn't want the mask to fall because it's afraid <laughs> if we drop the mask, what will happen then? It's, it's ultimately, that's a reflection with human beings, is the fear of dropping the mask with the Holy Spirit. If, if we're too afraid to share it with one another, how afraid must we be to share these thoughts in our mind with the Holy Spirit? If we're just afraid to even share it with our, our friends, our lovers, our neighbors, our, our, the people that we're surrounded with. So, so the beginning steps of no people pleasing and no private thoughts is don't go out and try to indiscriminately share all your dirty laundry with everyone you meet, everywhere you go. It's like with a machine gun. You want to hear it? (laughs) Hey world, I've got some dark thoughts. (laughs) That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is, is through guidance and through discernment, the Spirit will, will give you the ones that you can share. And maybe you're at a place in your life right now you, you, you look around yourself and you go, how many people in my circle do I feel safe and, and loved enough to share these thoughts with? And you may go, zero. Then Jesus would say, okay, let's journal. <laughs> you see how gentle Jesus is? Let's just journal, let's just put him on the paper, only for your eyes only. And he says, it's for my eyes too, but I won't judge you so. For your eyes only, just write it down. And that's why people journal. Audio journals. 
written journals. And then after a while you get a little confidence that maybe Jesus sends in a person in your life. It could be a counselor, a therapist, it could be someone. I never, I just met Carl Rogers once, but when I was out here in La Jolla in 1986 when the Course came into my life, his, Carl Rogers' presence on stage was such a beacon of light. I mean, I watched that whole auditorium. You could hear a pin drop when he was gently about 80 years old, right a few months before he passed away, and he was up there and he was, he was showing examples of his state of mind, his attitude in Rogerian therapy, and he was up there, I don't know how long he was on the stage, but when he finished, I was part of a standing ovation. Everybody rose up in the whole place and they cheered and they cheered because he was so transparent and so kind and so sweet and so loving. If I've never really had a therapist in this life, but if I had to have a therapist other than my dog Chipper, uh, who was the perfect Rogerian therapist, tongue licking the tears on my face year after year, didn't charge me any money, uh, <laughs> basically just wagging the tail, happy to see me every single time, no matter what my state of mind was, and licking my face for many, many years. But if I had to have a, a therapist, I would have wanted like Carl Rogers, because he was so non-judgmental. He, he really believed that everybody had the spark of truth in him, and he was just there to be a kind, loving, accepting, non-directive. He wasn't even trying to direct people how to live their lives. He was just the presence of love. It's interesting with The Course in Miracles because Carl Rogers, who I adored, had a graduate assistant named Bill Thedford. Bill Thedford, the, one of the first two Course in Miracles students on the planet, was a graduate assistant of Carl Rogers. And I was like, oh Jesus, what a plan. You've got Carl in there, and then no wonder I like Bill, because Bill was so soft and so kind and so sweet and so gentle. Well, he had a great mentor in Carl Rogers. This is how it works. You first find someone that you feel like you can expose and you can let it up in the comfort and the safety of the feeling of not being judged. And that's how it starts. And then the more you do this and the more you let up, the more comfortable you, comfortable you get at really doing this, you start to be more confident with it. You start to realize, hmm, I'm getting evidence now that I can share my darkest thoughts and secrets and I can be loved. I'm exposing, I'm releasing, and I'm being loved. So that's why we need to build our confidence with the Holy Spirit in this new method. And then I'll tell you what, as soon as you start getting cleared out of all those dark thoughts, your mind is like a clean lens where the light can shine through it. Then you can start to share messages of love, messages of hope, messages that inspire. That's what Carl Rogers was doing for me. He was book after book, love, hope, non-judgment. He was just shining decade after decade, after book after book after book. And that's the way it's gone in my life. I, I can never go from being shy to being, at, at breakfast this morning, you were saying, you never stop talking. You're just like Judy Scotch. You never stop talking. And I said, I think that's a compliment. But, but when you start to bubble in the joy, when you start to bubble, that's the way Judy is when you go to her house. You know, she can go for hours and hours just non-stop. But it's, you start to bubble in the joy, then you're teaching and you're sharing those beautiful God love ideas. And that's the ultimate direction all of this is going. That's why you expose to release the darkness, so you can be a conduit for the light. And when you are, then you, people have said, oh David, you just can't shut up about God. I said, well, you know, I, I'm, I love God. I, I'm happy with God. I don't, I don't feel I have issues with God because I'm not trying to make an identity anymore that, that is opposing God. I'm, I'm going into my Christness, I'm going into my light, my joy, my eternity. I love sharing from that space, from that presence. 
And that's also how you strengthen. That's where you strengthen it in your mind by giving it away. Ideas are strengthened as they're, as they're shared. So the ultimate thing is we're not trying to make some kind of a, a formula or a ritual of just sharing attack thoughts. Actually, my teachings got translated into Mandarin and proliferated all over China. And when we went over there, they had taken the teachings of no private thoughts and no people pleasing, and they'd formed what, you know, how we have Facebook groups over here, they had QQ groups, where people would get on and just viciously <laughs> go there's after are, There's a live messaging, so you, you can't edit, you just... Live messaging, live, QQ live, groups. Live, 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 and you see everybody's thoughts and attack on each other. So this was their <laughs> early take on no private thoughts and no people pleasing. Was, get on there and let fly live. And nobody can censor it and nobody can delete it or edit it. There's no moderators. And we're, so then we would meet with the groups. The first time we went over there I was just sharing. We land in, we land in Beijing, China. And we go there and there's over a hundred people waiting for us that have been reading the teachings from all over China. They've come from far reaches of Hainan and all, so some of the ones over near Burma, I mean all over. And then when we spoke for a while we did try to break the hundred some into small groups which was small groups over 25 and then I had my group around me and then they put two chairs, one for me and one for another person and they would jump out of this circle of 25 to sit across from me to share their pre private thoughts and their <laughs> secret thoughts because there's like a systematic kind of repression. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't share, you don't let the government know, mm -hmm. you don't tell a friend or whatever because, you know, Big Brother may be watching, you may have, you may have travel restrictions, you know, maybe it's just really an example of tight restrictions, but they would jump one at a time, that. <laughs> Or, and jump out <laughs> real happy. Maybe they had never shared that secret before with anybody in their entire life and they wanted to feel that they could do it and feel loved. So they could experience the gist of what we were talking about but once you try to take that out of the context of the healing presence then it, it starts to degrade into just a, a judgment fest. You know, and there's nothing special about speaking the thoughts to another person except that it's reflective of your own desire to give them over to the Holy Spirit. If you can give them over to the Holy Spirit directly and you feel the huge release of that, by all means, that's the best way to just do it directly with the Spirit. It seems like that's the first, the first way. That's the first way, obviously. I mean, that's and that's honestly that's what I that's what I do when I'm when I'm just my mind's just torn up, just, I feel like crap. I know I'm here. I'm listening to the voice of the ego, and I just I sit down. You know, Jesus, this is what I'm going through. I'm having a hard time wrestling around with it. Help me out. And I won't know what in the world happens, but <laughs> all of a sudden I, I feel better, and hours have gone by, and the shit show in my head's gone. Yeah. And I didn't. All I did was turn it over and admit that I didn't value it, and it wasn't. And I didn't want it. Thank you. That that is ultimately the first shot. And even when people have judgments around Mary Baker Eddy, you know about, oh my God, you didn't give them medicine, you didn't do this. No, no. Her her whole teaching of Christian Science is based on pray first, pray first. That's exactly what you're saying. And that's the most direct shot. And then people will, will say, wow, if I can do that, that, that seems to be the fastest, most direct shot to God that there is. And it, it's absolutely the case. For many people, they, they find themselves, they can say, I, I am willing. They will use the words. They'll, they'll, they'll pray the prayers. But if, if it's the prayer of the heart. God knows the prayer of the heart. And when you really have that desire and that willingness, that is that is the fast track. In fact, that's for me it was like praying when I first got the course for the first two and a half years. I didn't go to course groups. I didn't know another course student on 
the planet, uh, you know, that I that I was was nearby to talk to or whatever. So it it was a very like you're sharing a very <coughs> intimate experience. Like okay, here it is. You're giving this. What's on the paper is just for my eyes. It's just for my lesson. It's not anything else. And that get, helped me really move through things yeah. in a fast way. Like plan A and plan B. You were talking about that earlier. Yes, yeah. the plan A. Yeah, the plan A, that's plan A. That's definitely plan A. And to the extent that you're willing to question everything about your self-concept, in the end, that's, that's like the section toward the end of the text, you know, self versus self-concept. I started to realize that everything that I believed about everything in this world, my identity, my career, my family, it takes you, if you go with that fully and, and I mean, really sincerely, what it will do, it will dismantle you from, from every belief that you have about time and space without exceptions. So you actually end up being a little more like Mr. Magoo or like Chauncey Gardner in being there. You, you show up and you are so clueless, you just don't know what's, what's going to happen. And people laugh now because they, they are around me and they see that I'm, I'm quite clueless and, and I don't really have to discern or figure out or interpret the meaning of things because everything just works out very miraculously. It's like it's arranged by spirit, but there is no sense of a person doing it. I don't think about what I'm going to say when I'm talking to somebody. That's the delight. Just coming together, you're smiling, you're laughing, you're hugging, you're gazing. You don't even know if there's going to be words. Maybe there won't be. Oh, that's fun. Just a, a, a glowy, warm-hearted experience with no words. That's a lot of fun. But you just, you just don't know. And, and I like that this movie will show how it can extend even to making a movie. For me, travel. I couldn't imagine traveling around the world for three decades. Some of you know when you take a trip with, with airports or with driving in the car for long hours or going through body searches. I can't even count how many body searches I've been through. I can't count how many metal detectors I've gone through, how many customs, security, luggage, how many zips have I done in three decades? <laughs> zip, zip. You know, you, you lose track of it all because it's, it's, miracles are involuntary, Jesus tells us. They should not be under conscious control. You, you go into Miracles are a collaborative adventure. When I first got into it, I was like, that's scary. I was like the wallflower. I don't even know how to collaborate in my own family, and you're wanting me to collaborate with strangers. And Jesus is like, yeah, you'll get the hang of it. Don't worry, miracles are, I'll do it. I'll do it for you. You just, you just be willing. I'll do it all for you. And then as you go into it, you start to realize there's great joy in collaborations. Collaborating with websites, collaborating with movies, collaborating with gatherings like this. It's, it's like it's all among friends. We're all, we're all among friends. We're all in the same thing. So, in answer to your question, what you're looking at, that tendency to hold on to the secrets, that's, that's where we start, of course. And because of that, there's been a way that I don't express, of course, why well, I was the same. Yeah. Like hiding it, holding on. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm glad you mentioned that too because when I started going to course groups and traveling, uh, I said, how am I supposed to know what to say with all these different people? And I, there was that prayer on page 24 in the first edition and 28 in the second edition, I am here only to be truly helpful. I just memorized that prayer and every time I would go through a doorway to a restroom, to visit my grandmother, to a grocery store, to amusement park. Every time I would, I would pause before I would go to wherever I was going and pray that prayer. I'm here only to be truly helpful. I'm here to represent Him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do, for He who sent me will direct me. I am content to be wherever He wishes and I will be healed as I let him teach me to heal. So I would do like a, a silent prayer. I wouldn't say it out loud. That would look a little strange in the 
going into the restroom. What the heck? Get out of the way. <laughs> I would just kind of pause, pray, and then when I would go into that grocery store or go to visit somebody, I would be feel more open to being guided. Because in the end, even the words that we speak can be guided by the Holy Spirit. Our, our actions, uh, like Amma, the great hugging saint. I, I love going around the world and hugging people all over the place. It just feels so warm in my heart. But it took a while to relax into that, like for it to feel natural. And the Course teaches us that from the ego's perspective that everything we perceive is called selective perception. Selective perception means that you believe you can control your own words, that you can control your own actions, and that you are in charge of the behaviors in a direct way. What the Course teaches us is what you do, including your words, comes from what you think. And you actually have no direct control over the body. You simply control everything by the, the mind you think with. You're either in your right mind or your wrong mind. You're either connected to source or you're disconnected. And everything that we call behavior and, and perception in the world is all coming, it's being motivated by the thoughts in the mind. So the body is completely neutral. The body has no feelings, the mind tells it what to feel. The body has, speaks no words by itself, the mind speaks through the body, depending on which, which one it's aligned to, the ego or the spirit. The body is, is not autonomous, but it's part of the mind, but it it's, seems to be under the direction of the mind. The mind, egoic mind made it up and now the mind directs the body. You may hate the body, you may seem to love the body. It, those things are just meanings that are projected onto a completely neutral thing. It's just an image, no different than a, a tree leaf or a blade of grass. It's, it doesn't even contain life. The world, we talk about inorganic and organic and what has life and what doesn't. I remember years ago when I was doing the dishes, I had Ken Wapnick tape playing and and somebody from the audience said, what does the Course say about life on other planets? And Ken said, the Course says there's no life on this planet. <laughs> <laughs> and my hands were all sudsy and I was just like, oh yeah, now, now I'm getting into this Course. The humor, there is no life on this planet. Imagine if you give yourself over how happy how joyful and freedom, because then you're not going to try to protect and defend and take sides and, and try to tell people, you've got to stop this, you're killing this, or you're doing this. You know, even when we went to China and everything, uh, they picked us up at the airport one day and we were driving from the airport. It was a really gray day. And then the driver started to look over at me and he said, I must apologize. And I said, no, no, you don't need to apologize. Well, for what? What are you apologizing for? He said, for the pollution. This was back near the Olympics when the, the pollution, and he said, I apologize for our gray skies. I apologize mm -hmm. that you come here and you're greeted with thing. And I'm like, oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. We're, we're not here to judge things as being negative in the world, we're here to extend the light. We are the light of the world. We need to be able to blow kisses towards anything and anyone, including gray skies. I said, it's, it's, it's a beautiful gray. I told him, when he was I apologize for the, gray, for the grayness. I was saying, no, it's beautiful gray. Gray is beautiful. Because the beauty comes from our purpose. The, the beauty comes from forgiveness. That's, that's the whole thing. When we get into our joy of our function, we're in that Ray Stevens song. Everything is beautiful in its own way. You know, it's like that's the feeling when, when you're in touch with the light. And therefore, also, you won't be defending anything. You're not, you know, when A Course in Miracles went through its dark ages too, like 
like everything in this planet. Remember, this is the ego's world. So at one point, there was seven copyright lawsuits going around mm -hmm. the Course in Miracles simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And I'm still bebopping around, going to course groups and everything, and then people started coming up to me and they'd say, um, mm, what do you think about this copyright thing? And, and they'd say to me, they'd say, tell us, what does, what does Jesus say? Who is the right side? Which side oh, should God. we take? And I, oh, I was like, which book are you reading? There's nothing in A Course in Miracles that says anything about taking sides. <laughs> it's all about unified perception. It's all about joining. It's all about connecting. Well, you have to pick a side, David. You know, I said, I don't have to pick a side. You have, somebody's got to be right and somebody's got to be wrong. I don't think so. And then they would say, well, they'd ask more personal questions like, well, you had, a, had some websites and I heard that you were contacted by the copyright owners. I said, yeah, that's true. And they said, would you tell us about how that went? I said, certainly. They, I, I got a call. They said, um, we do not like that you are using the word A Course in Miracles as the title of your website. We are the copyright holders and you have A Course in Miracles at the top of your website. I said, okay, what do you want me to do? And they said, take it off. Use it somewhere else. I said, great. Then the next thing was, we, the, tr the acronym ACIM is also protected by copyright as well. We do not like that you have ACIM at the top of your website. Okay. Take it out. Okay. Anything else? Uh, no, generally, that's, that's pretty much all. So then the woman who worked for the copyright holders and I had this wonderful discussion. Well, we did it. Oh, I just visited my mother. We had just the most loving discussion after the business was out of the way. So these people come up to me and they say, didn't that bother you that you're, you're just sharing all this joy and you're using the words of Course in Miracles? I said, no, no. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's. What is God's? Our connection with the Holy Spirit, our internal connection with God, is, is rendering unto God what is God's. There's nobody and nothing in this world that can take away your connection to your source. As far as the world goes, things seem to be owned and operated and those things, and Jesus said, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar. I had no interest in opposing anybody. I had no interest in, in trying to even debate with anybody. I had no interest in changing the world because Jesus told me, seek not to change the world. That could be by seek not to change the copyright holder. Seek not to change your neighbor. Seek not to change your partner. <laughs> Seek not to change the course. Stay with your connection, your intuitive divine connection, and that's where your love, your joy, your safety is. And also, when I'm in with my connection with my source, I'm not going to take a side. In fact, I'll say I, I will do more than not take a side. I won't have an opinion. I won't have an opinion about what seems to be going on. Jesus was really he was so connected with God, he wasn't political. You didn't really see him trying to, the, the, the day, he wasn't saying, well, the Pharisees this, or the scribes, or the, the Romans. Uh, I think a lot of people were hoping that, even some of the apostles were hoping that he would rise up as this great force in the world, and he would cast the Romans out of Galilee. He'll show them. Power of God will show those Romans. They can take over countries. They can dominate the world. God's going to show up and Caesar, you are going down. The Roman Empire is going down. Now Jesus never talked about destroying or opposing even the Roman Empire of the day. So with people today when they have difficulty with politicians, think about Jesus' day. The Roman Empire taking over all these countries, and Jesus had nothing ever to say about opposing 
the Roman empires. In fact, the only time I remember Jesus mentioning Caesar is he said, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. That's not even an opposition. So this is where you start to realize it's your consciousness that needs to be purified. And if you're having for and against thoughts, like which is common in the sleeping mind, I'm against this, I'm for this, I'm going to take a stance against this and this. If you, for example, have a strong idea in your mind about taking a stance against gun violence, what's the best way to take a stance for something that will, that will be reflective of your stance against is to be peaceful. If you are peaceful, if you're peaceful all the time, if you never get into arguments, if you never get into debates, if you get to such a purity where you demonstrate nonviolence, like Gandhi was attempting, if you really demonstrate nonviolence, like, like Gandhi was talking about, that is the greatest stance you could ever take. You, we're here to be a demonstration of divine love and divine peace. We're not here to try to divide and conquer. We're not here to point fingers. We're not here to take a single stance because if you take a stance in the world of duality, it simply means you believe in the duality. If you take a forgiveness stance in your mind, you dispel the entire projected world of, of opposites, of conditions, of issues. So if you have an issue that you feel you are reacting to emotionally, I would tell you that it's the interpretation in your mind that you're reacting to. It's not what actually seems to be happening on the screen of the world. We always react to the interpretations, to the judgments in our mind. In fact, that was the reading I heard today. Jesus said, here's, here's one thing that will, that will bring you to peace and will keep you in peace. Learn it and learn it well. And he says, you never hate your brother for his sins, but only for your own. You first believe in the guilt, or the sin, or the error in your own mind, and then you push that out of awareness. You actually decide for it, but push it out of awareness, and then it seems to get acted out in the dream world. And he even tells us that the dream world has two parts. There's the dream that you dream in secret, Jesus says, and the dream that you gave away. What we perceive as the, the physical world, the cosmos, is the dream that was given away. Almost like, oh, it's just happening to me. I, I didn't do this, but it's, you know, this world is a cruel world and it's always attacking me. But what we don't acknowledge is the dream that we dream in secret, and that's what Carl Jung called the shadow, the unconscious mind. Why do I meet so many people in California that love to talk about Warner Earhart? I just was being hosted in Huntington Beach, and they're like, I love Warner Earhart. Warner Ear Earhart, the forum, and education, landmark education. What did Warner Earhart talk about except the unconscious mind? What did Carl Jung talk about except the unconscious mind? Even things like Scientology, which is has many <laughs> judgments and reputations about it, but what was all the auditing about? The unconscious mind. The thing is, anything that starts to talk to you about the unconscious mind, no matter what book you read, no matter what's Warner Earhart or, or L. Ron Hubbard or you name it, Freud or whatever, anything that starts to acknowledge the unconscious mind is getting at that part of the self-concept that's under the surface what Jesus calls the dream that you dream in secret. And that's why it's so helpful. And why have all the religions of the world failed to bring about peace? Is because they're on the surface. Do this and you'll go to heaven. Do this and you'll go to hell. Here's the good, here's the bad. Here's the good rituals and here's the bad rituals. Where's the unconscious mind in the good rituals and the bad rituals? It's gone. It's not even discussed. That's why 
religion as most people conceive of it, people get burned out with religion because religions are simply theologies. The good things and the bad things. Except they can't agree. A lot of the religions have difficulty agreeing on the good things and the bad things. Same with morality. Same with ethics. But Jesus is helping us with the Course in Miracles to go down into our mind <coughs> to, he just says, right mind, Holy Spirit, wrong mind, ego. And he's helping us, he's saying you're choosing between these two options, and your split mind, you have a split mind that believes in the ego and the Holy Spirit, you're choosing from both every second. In fact, you're not even aware most of the times that you're choosing between these two. You're just aware of the surface of consciousness, behaviors, and so forth. So, that's what I got from the Course. It was learning, learning, learning to discern between what's right-minded and what's wrong-minded. Can I give you an example? Because people say, I wish I could tell the difference. I would be home free if I could tell the difference. Well, let's take a look at right mind, right-minded use of the body, use of the puppet, marionette, and the wrong-minded. The Holy Spirit only uses the body, which the ego made, the ego made the body, but the Holy Spirit only uses the body for one purpose. One purpose? Think of all the thousands and tens of thousands of purposes that are given to the body. In all the different occupations, and all the different roles, all those things are different purposes for the body. And the Holy Spirit says, God only has one purpose for the body and that's communication. It's a communication device. It's no different than your smartphone. Do you live in your smartphone? Some of you may believe you do. <laughs> you probably spend more time with it than you do with your, your family or your relatives. But, for these cases, for this example, do you live in your smartphone? No, you don't live inside of your smartphone. It's just a device that has some helpful, some utility and some helpfulness for, for what? Usually, you would say for communication. Imagine if you could transfer it from your smartphone to your body and you start to think of your body as just a device mm -hmm. that your mind can use. And instead of being so concerned about how young or old the body is, or how fat or skinny, or how toned or flabby, or how articulate or non-articulate, or how beautiful or ugly, instead of being concerned with all these meaningless things, which are all just ego projections, you started to think, what is the purpose for my body? Am I here to extend love, hugs, smiles, laughter, words of comfort, words of blessings? You know, am I here to use it as a communication device for the Holy Spirit? Or am I going to give it over to the ego to use, which will simply reinforce the ego in my mind as a separate identity? private body with a private mind and private thoughts. There's, there's the options. So, the Holy Spirit only uses the body as a communication device, and the ego uses the body, here's three categories Jesus gives, for pride, for pleasure, and for attack. That's what the ego uses the body. Pride, fame, notori not notoriety, recognition, you know, what's in it for me? You know, that kind of, that, that's the pride part. That will block you from the light. Pleasure. Well, pleasure is, in this world, a part of a dualistic concept, and pleasure and pain are both part of the same coin, but they seem to be different, but it's the same coin. Wait a minute, that's pretty steep. Jesus, let's stop there, that's a little bit steep. You're telling me pleasure and pain are the same. Yeah, he says, it's impossible to seek for pleasure without finding pain, and he tells us the reason that they're the same is because they both share the same purpose. They share the same ego purpose. What is that? They both reinforce the body as being real. And think about it. When you're in the most pleasurable ecstasy, 
the body seems very real and when you're in the most painful migraine, childbirth, whatever you're going through, the body seems very real. They both reinforce the reality in the mind as being real. So that's why they're the same. An attack is the third one. Obviously, why, why do soldiers seem to become injured and die? Is it because of what happens on the battlefield? No. It's because of the guilt in the mind. It's because of the forgotten identity. If you're out fighting on a battlefield, you're not aware of the Christ. Remember the one who said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Remember the one who 2,000 years ago said, If somebody smites you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. He doesn't say fight back. He doesn't say destroy. Someone smites you on one cheek, destroy them. Oh, that's more military intelligence. But that, <laughs> that, is, that is not actually the teachings of Jesus Christ. So you start to realize that attack in any form is not helpful because it reinforces separation. And you can't be gentle, you can't be defenseless if you still hold on to attack. But, he's not talking about the form because remember, the form is neutral. The form isn't the one that's doing the attacking. It's the mind that tells the body what to do. It's the mind that says, oh, you need to defend yourself as a body. That mind is the ego. So these teachings are very deep and very practical, but the key to spiritual awakening is in the practicality, the transfer of training. It's in making no exceptions to the teachings. It's not compartmentalizing certain parts of your life and say, well, I'll be defenseless with my mom and dad, and it's not easy, but I'll do that, and I'll be defenseless with my children, I'll be defenseless with my pet. But when I go out into that jungle of economic survival, I will go out and I will be the most ruthless manager, the biggest competitor. I will devour the competition in my business. I'll be meek when I'm inside my home. I'm going to be vicious and competitive out there. <laughs> Jesus is like, hmm, transfer of training error here. We need to move it around. Are we ready for a break? Well, no, I, I, I have a question about oh, yeah. what you're asking. Yes. So, as an entrepreneur, um, that's an interesting idea, right? So, I'm not even sure what the question is, but as a salesperson, right, I'm out in the field uh, connecting with others, and there are seemingly other entities uh, creating some other challenges, right? So that I'm not able to serve clients in the way that I would like to serve them. There are restrictions, there are whatevers. So how am I to, to be in the world and yet express what I, what I choose to express, which is love, compassion, really being a service, um, and allowing myself just to turn the other cheek and not be disturbed by these seeming blocks to doing <coughs> what I see as service. Yeah. Well, thankfully we have, we have examples like Zig Ziglar. We have, we have amazing examples of those who would still go out to do their job that, <coughs> that they was very much a part of their identity but you would hear them, before they would go into a building, they would, they would stop like I was doing and pray. Mm. They, would, they would say, okay, I seem to be going on a sales call or a, a presentation or whatever, but I want to pray first. I want to, I want to give this whole encounter and this whole thing over to the Spirit to guide me. And then amazingly, the Zig Ziglar's and the great way showers of undoing the business self-concept would go in there and they'd have this wonderful 10-15 minute encounter of, of happiness and laughter and then they'd get the, get the contract. They'd get the things, they would still have things that were still within their, their realm of their self-concept, but they would be like, wow, that was amazing. I put my intent first for, for a joyful encounter and then 
everything seemed to click in. In fact, that's the way it's gone for me in these last three decades because, because I was trained in 10 years of university and I, I was trained in competitive ways. I did come from a sports family and you better believe when I was a kid and the Cincinnati Reds were in the World Series or playing LA and then trying to get to play Boston or one of those Eastern teams, you know, we were like, big red machine. Let's roll, baby. Let's get to let's get to Pete Rose and Johnny Bench and Joe Morgan. See if they can handle that. Oh, I came from a very competitive family, and we were, you know, and we were trying to get to the Super Bowl with the Bengals. And we were trying to really roll over everybody and dominate. You know, be like the Golden State Warriors back then. You know, really dynasty, dynasty. But then I came to a Course in Miracles. Remember, now I've given it all over to Jesus. Even my family, my competitiveness, everything. There's a line in the Course where Jesus says, never underestimate your need to be vigilant against the idea of competition. I was like, oh, there goes the Reds. <laughs> there, goes, there goes Pete Rose, Charlie Hustle, my idol. Jesus is like, well, yeah, you know, you, you do like Gandhi too. Yeah, that's right. Gandhi's not nonviolent. Yeah. You think Gandhi was competitive? Well, probably if he had any shred of competitiveness against the British, it probably got him in trouble. He even got sick one time on the boat when he went to England. Uh, and people say, what, was Gandhi seasick out on the ocean? And I said, no, Jesus told me he, was, he just had a little bit of guilt in his mind. It's always guilt in the mind that gets projected onto the body. It's never the circumstances of the world. It's always guilt. So what I had to do was, I had to say to Jesus, listen, I like sports. So I'm going to give you my sports. I'm going to give you my best teams and my ones I root for. And I'm going to give you all that. And you're going to have to, you're going to have to show me a new way. So he would take me to the stadium to learn to watch, like he said, let's watch this baseball and football that you like. Let's play a little, practice a little zen here. <laughs> where, And then I met my friend Dorothy, and Dorothy one time, she went to a sporting event, I think it was a football event, and the one team started marching down the field, and then they scored a touchdown, and she got up and she cheered. And then the other team went down the other way, and they scored a touchdown, and she got up and she cheered. <laughs> and the whole, the whole event, she kept cheering. She said, that was a great play. Every play. That was a great play. And somebody next to her tried to explain, listen, you can't do this. You can't do this. It's just not right. You, you root for this team or for that team. But you don't root for both of them. So I started practicing when I watched Wimbledon. I started practicing when I watched baseball games because I was very competitive and everything. And he would have me start to see the Zen moment where I would just see this wonderful rally at Wimbledon and then he would teach me to see it as a whole and not root for the player. So when Steffi Graf or whatever would hit the ball and it would crack into the tape, if I was rooting for one tennis player or the other, when that ball cracked into the tape, I was watching with eyes to see which way is it going to drop, which side. And I would even, I was a big Jimmy Connors fan, I would sit there, he'd be playing Wimbledon, and I would be in the chair, and I would sit there for three hours, rooting, 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 sweating, and my mom was like, you're ruining the furniture! You're sweating on the furniture! Learn how to watch a tennis match without so much rooting for one side or the other and I'd be so then now Jesus has got me like ooh look at the dance look at the dance see the dance enjoy the dance and you can actually do this with, with tennis with baseball with business you can actually enjoy the dance in fact the last uh, decades of my life has been everything has been provided for the travels everything I've done everywhere I've gone down to the smallest details, it's been provided and arranged without a sense of struggle or effort, without a sense of striving. Because that's what the ego tells us, is that only good things come to those who strive. And I would say, 
everything turns into a beautiful dance for those that surrender into that guidance. And, and even with business, it, it takes practice. I have no doubt, it definitely takes a lot of practice. But then you start to relish those encounters where you're not so bent on an outcome. You know, the sale suddenly becomes just something that you can live with or live without because you, you feel more that sustenance underneath you that's always there. That's basically what I brought into my work life. And it's interesting to observe the other people around me who are very adamant taking sides. Now, of course, I want to, I imagine that I know how to take care of the client. What the hell do I really know? But um, it's just funny, it's interesting to have these very specific situations to bring to the conversation to go, ah, okay, I, I'm getting this, you know? Um, so thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Susan. Thank you. There, you're, you're saying we don't have to give up football. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy the dance, even with the football now. You know, the thing about it, the, the, the best challenges for me would, would be when I would go to like Course in Miracles conferences or Course in Miracles events. One time I, I was invited, invited to Northern California years ago to do a retreat at a Franciscan retreat center. It was a Course in Miracles retreat. And when it came time to do my sessions, like we're just doing a free flow session here. Anybody ask anything and there's no kind of, we'll, we'll take a break here in a moment. But I went there to do it and basically the format of the thing was, it was set up like a political debate. Um, the format of the Course in Miracles thing. And so I went there and people had been reading my stuff and listening and they had all kinds of questions. But when they would ask the question from the audience, there was a man next to me, a minister that had a stopwatch. And I could only talk for, if, if, if it was my turn, I could could talk for like five minutes, or if it was somebody else's turn, I could have a two-minute rebuttal to the other person that was speaking. We're, we're supposed to be showing up and, and speaking for God. So anyway, I go out there, and there's stopwatches all over the place, and they go, okay, here's one minister who's going to hold the stopwatch, and then there's a minister, and then there's David. And somebody would ask a question about forgiveness or enlightenment or whatever, and I would go, and it would be time. I could be in the middle of a sentence talking about enlightenment. Imagine Muji, or imagine, you know, some teacher, Gangaji or something, with a stopwatch on her in the middle of it. So I'd be like talking, 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 and in the joy of it, and then time, and then write the word in the middle of the sentence stop. Then the next one would speak to me. Well, the audience at this Course in Miracles gathering, they were just like, they were, they were just, all their stuff was coming up around this. And to tell you the truth, I'm not showing up there to speak. I'm showing up there to have a great time and feel a connection with everyone, including the guy that the stuff. So he catches me in the middle of the sense, I just like... And so, the most important thing in, in enlightenment is time. <laughs> I'm absolutely content. I'm like, just smiling, and it's like, over to you, <laughs> you know, it's like, well, it was so much fun because I was doing this, and then the guy, I got to ask a question, and so I started to respond, and I was speaking, and the guy holding the stopwatch, I mentioned his name in the reply, and he did not hit the stopwatch, so he, did, I went on for like, seven, eight minutes uh, talking <laughs> until the other one said, hey, hey, stop, stop. This is against the rules. <laughs> he looked over at the timekeeper and he said, you have given David two, three more minutes than his allotted time. And the, the timekeeper smiled and he said, I know. He mentioned my name in the, <laughs> the reply. I've got my hand on the stopwatch. And I'm just going to let him finish whatever he wants to say and take as long as he wants. While the whole crowd, it burst the tension. We were all connected. We were all back in the dance. 
we were there to remember to laugh. It wasn't about the words. It was a beautiful, I still remember that time because I was having so much fun and I thought, I can play with time. I can play with anything. I can play with, the, with this format that they've got. But the, the key is the playfulness of not taking anything personally and not having any investment that things be different than they are. That's been the greatest lesson. That's been, oh, that's been the lesson with all these travels for all these years. When I, when I miss the plane, when I'm on the plane and the plane won't take off because there's a part that they said, the plane is broken. The plane is broken? They say that at an airport? I mean, I just burst into laughter. We're sorry, the plane is broken. <laughs> this is too funny. I look at the other people, they're all, they're all like, they said the plane is broken. They got their cell phone. I said, my honey, they said the plane is broken. <laughs> we, were all, we were all having such a Lucille Ball moment that they would actually come on the intercom and say the plane is broken. That, that we, we forgot about time. We forgot about connections. We forgot about the airport. We got into the joy and the laughter of just this, the plane is broken, you know. None of us had ever heard the plane is broken. So that's what I'm saying. If, if you can get into this so deeply and just trust that you have everything that you need in the moment and there's nothing ever missing, you can live a light-hearted, happy, joyful life because you're not going to have those expectations, those ego expectations, that things should be different. And it will help you out even if emergencies, like I've been in countries where there's civil war going on, there's guns all over the place, and I am going through this country like Colombia, you know, maybe like 15, 10, 15 years ago when they had the civil war going on, I waved to the people with the guns. They got these big <laughs> guns, and they got these real serious looks on their face like they're going to shoot somebody, and I'm like waving at them, and they're like, they start smiling at me because they're so surprised nobody has ever waved at them with a big gun. You know? I was down in Argentina one time and it was like, it was a bank and they had these two security guards there and I mean these big pistols and big guns and, and they're ready to exchange, you know, like, like the guards over there in Buckingham Palace and everything, they're ready to exchange. So one's like, goes over and they both look at each other and I'm like watching them and then they start kissing each other on the cheek and <laughs> hugging. I'm like, that's cool. Security guards kissing. I love it. But those are the kind of witnesses you draw when your mind is free of attack thoughts. You start to see them all over the place because they're just little symbols of how sweet sweet things can be. How are we doing? Are we, are we about... We can take a little break, but then we have a, a shorter session before lunch. Okay. Yeah. What time is lunch? It's one. I think we have one a break at 50 one. Minutes. Okay. 50 minutes. Well, how's everyone doing? You want to take a little, maybe like a 10 minute yeah. potty break, stretch break, yeah. 10 to 15 minutes? Yeah. Hugging yeah. break. Yeah. That's right. What's you that? come all the way from Sweden. Yeah. She's, she said, let's take a hugging break. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mystery School Alumni. <laughs> Mystery School Alumni. And this just happened to be in the same time that you're here. Right. Yeah. We're guys here. We're guys here. Same guys. More like a topic. That's why I'm saying Did you say 15 minutes for lunch? Yeah, wait, it's 12, 10 past 12. So then maybe I'll have to, uh, I can go get us something. And then you can test it. Uh, you can test it. It's probably better to test it than to be So it's 50 minutes. It's pretty quick, maybe like a few questions, and that's pretty much it. So come back. Then you go, you will come back. And the equipment's all set, then you're going to go into a, oh, a, uh, 
Hi there. <laughs>